todos ustedes. Soy el doctor Oscar Valencia, coordinador de este espacio de educación médica continua. Y antes de dar inicio a nuestra sesión, en nombre de la Escuela de Medicina y Ciencias de la Salud del Tecnológico de Monterrey, les doy la más cordial bienvenida a la sesión académica de pediatría. Esta es una, nuestra segunda eh, 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 presentación del módulo de infectología pediátrica y tendremos un tema muy, muy interesante y le voy a conceder la palabra al doctor eh, Oscar Tamés para que sea él quien presente a nuestro ponente. Adelante, Oscar. Muchas gracias, doctor. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a todos a nuestra sesión académica de pediatría de la Escuela de Medicina. Y el día de hoy es un gusto eh, presentar al doctor Justin Penner para que platiquemos mucho más a detalle y abonar un, un espacio adicional al tema de infecciones congénitas. Como saben, en este espacio ya se ha platicado sobre sífilis congénita, hemos tenido también espacio para platicar de citomegalovirus congénito, pero actualmente se vive una reformación en el pensamiento de cómo abordar a estas infecciones congénitas y es justo el momento de repensar el famoso TORCH o STORCH que nos llegaron a enseñar en la escuela en algún momento y que los estudiantes actuales están aprendiendo, pero ya están cambiando este paradigma, ¿verdad? Entonces vamos a, a cambiar un poquito los motores y para presentar al doctor Justin Penner, Uh, thank you, Justin, for being here with us. And Justin is currently a pediatric infectious diseases and clinical immunology consultant at Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa, Canada. And he, when he completed pediatric training at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, he went on to work as a pediatric infectious disease at Imperial. Imperial College Healthcare Trust, where I had the, the pleasure to meet him when he was still a fellow in training and, and his interest in congenital infections grew and he trained at St. Mary's Hospital and further expanded his previous work with congenital syphilis in Canada. And subsequently, he went on to work as the senior clinical fellow in pediatric infectious diseases at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And if you could give me the next slide, and Justin has also completed a master's in science in, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, in Tropical Medicine and International Health. He's also a, a member of the Society of Infectious Disease and Immunization Committee and teaching faculty with the Penta Network. And he also uh, focuses on, re on research and research activities on uh, infections that affect marginalized indigenous populations. So it's a great pleasure to have you here with us, Justin, to uh, give us a, 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 this broad uh, scenario of congenital infections. And thank you so much. The microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Oscar. I'm just gonna share my slides. Can everyone see them? Yes. Perfect. So thank you so much for the invite. Um, I, I really love it when things come for full circle. So as Oscar mentioned, we worked together when we were just budding infectious diseases physicians many, many years ago. Um, so it's 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 definitely nice to be in touch and to give this presentation to you guys, something that is very near and dear to my heart um, and, and something that I think everyone uh, needs to be aware of, um, and that is uh, congenital infections and specifically syphilis. All right. So I'll just give you the outline of what we will touch on today. So the, the first, and I think one of the more important concepts is really in the year of 2024, um, re redefining what we used to think of as the torch screen. And I think I will try to convince you that the uh, traditional torch screen is something that is, is probably quite outdated uh, and that we, we need to go into the new millennium when thinking about uh, congenital infections. This really will broaden our scope of congenital infections. And I'm gonna also try to convince you that when you think of one, really we should be thinking of all of them. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you why that is the case and, and simply because there is so much overlap. In this talk, I'm gonna to try to focus a bit, uh, most of the talk on congenital syphilis. So we'll go through a bit systematically the epidemiology, then the biology, some of the clinical features, and then the diagnostics and management of children either exposed or with proven congenital syphilis. And, and again, as I mentioned, I think that this is likely going to become a bigger problem. Um, and certainly in my setting in Canada uh, has already really exploded, unfortunately. If we have time um, at the end, um, again, mostly because this is a, a something of interest to me and, and I think more and more recognized is, is enterovirus infections in the perinatal period. So we'll touch a bit on congenital enterovirus kind of following the same um, approach uh, as outlined here for congenital syphilis. Uh, 
and at the end, we'll we'll leave plenty of time for everyone's questions, um, and and hopefully the the it will spur on uh, some good discussion. All right, so we're going to move on from Torch, and we're going to call it Scorch now. This is a paper that we wrote, um, uh, a review of congenital infections. And to be honest, it doesn't matter which um, acronym you use, um, but the traditional TORCH screen really leaves out some of the important ones. And um, as much as we try to uh, eliminate the O for other, um, uh, unfortunately, we kept this in our uh, our acronym as well. And this is simply because the our knowledge of congenital infections is ever expanding and, and certainly uh, with new and emerging infections and with our understanding of current infections, we'll probably realize that uh, there are more and more congenital infections out there that just simply aren't recognized. So this is one of the um, figures in our review paper that we wrote, which I think just outlines nicely that there are uh, considerable overlap in all of the congenital infections. One of the things that I always tell my trainees and fellows and what I've learned from my mentors is, is that, you know, bloodborne viruses and um, uh, sexually transmitted infections, they all travel in packs. So when you think of one, you think of them all. And as you can see here in uh, the figure, so if we, if we divide things by system or by, uh, by organ, there are very rarely any congenital infection that only has kind of one etiologic uh, pathogen in the box here. So for example, when you have a baby that has sepsis, that has you know, no found bacterial cause, um, there are plenty of different pathogens that you can think of. Similarly, you know, babies with uh, uh, skin disease, with blisters, with the kind of traditional blueberry muffin rash, there is plenty of different pathogens to think of. The other thing that we tried to move on from the, the traditional tort screen uh, which I will touch on in the next slide as well, is that, you know, really our diagnostics now are, are more than just serology. And serology is always um, made difficult by the fact that when you test serology in the baby, um, it's mostly representative of what's going on in the mum. And that's simply because we, as you know, there's passive transfer of antibodies from the mum to the baby. And that always complicates diagnostics. Uh, over and above that, we have expanding molecular diagnostic capacities. Um, and, and again, this depends on which setting you work in. Uh, as you know, in the lower middle income countries, the, the, the diagnostics for, for example, syphilis are, are not the same as, as we may have in tertiary quaternary centers. But we, we are more and more relying on rapid diagnostic tests, which are also helpful um, when we don't have such resources. Um, and more than just tests in a lab, the other thing that we really wanted to stress is, is that it's more than just blood tests. And really, this is a multidisciplinary approach to uh, diagnostics in congenital infections and subsequently treatment and follow-up. So for many, many of these uh, pathogens and these infectious agents, we involve our audiology colleagues because many of them present with sensor neuro hearing loss. We involve our ophthalmology colleagues because many of them present with various eye findings, both anterior eye findings that we may not see as clinicians. And we need someone much more expert to look in the back of the eye and do a dilated um, um, eye exam. Uh, we also involve our neurology colleagues in certain circumstances, um, our cardiology colleagues. So really, this is not just infectious diseases physicians that need to be thinking about it, although we are certainly the ones who probably think about it the most. Um, but really, this is, is pan-specialty. Pan All right. So from a diagnostic perspective, as I mentioned, the torch screen, which, you know, follows mostly diagnostics from the perspective of serology, uh, again, is really outdated. Um, and this is also a, a figure that we um, that we made for our review paper, just really emphasizing that point. And again, on the left here, you can see how it's really a multi-system. Uh, congenital affections are really multi-system and very rarely affect one organ and only one organ and can present with multi-system organ failure, like, like I said before, with sepsis, it's culture negative. So over and above the regular blood tests, so your CBC, your electrolytes, your biochemistry, you know, the serology may not just, that you do, may not just be from the baby, but for certain things, which I'll get to in a second, such as syphilis and toxoplasma is another example, where 
really the importance is doing a paired serology so we can compare the titers between mom and the baby. Molecular testing has also really improved in the past uh, uh, decade. And this is uh, molecular testing just beyond PCRs in the blood, but uh, we have PCR capability in the urine, for example, with congenital CMV, which is the gold standard test. We can do PCR for certain uh, infections, certain congenital infections in the saliva. Um, uh, we can do uh, PCR in uh, skin samples. So as I will come to in a second, not just for HSV, when we do a, a swab of the uh, vesicular lesions for HSV PCR, in many settings, we can also do that for uh, syphilis. Um, and often there's a bit of overlap between that. So we certainly don't want to miss syphilis and really just think it's HSV, cutaneous HSV. Um, PCR can also be done on nasal secretion samples. And syphilis is another good example where depending on your lab capabilities, we can detect syphilis PCR in the, um, uh, the nasal secretions. And then uh, we go on to, you know, incorporate radiologic testing and, and, as our um, radiology capabilities are also improving, we're actually able to see a lot more that we potentially would miss on, for example, a head ultrasound. Um, and I'll give you the example of CMV. So the new European guidance for congenital CMV is that really most, if not all children should have an MRI and that an ultrasound of their head is probably not sensitive enough to pick things up, but the spectrum is always moving. Audiology, so sensor neuro hearing loss, it's really important that the audiologists um, have the capabilities to do formal audiology testing. And oftentimes our uh, routine uh, uh, screening at birth, if that's even available in the location you do. So in Canada, for example, in almost all provinces, we do routine hearing screening at birth, but it's not necessarily the diagnostic ABRs. So for the congenital infections, if you're thinking that, uh, involving your audiology colleagues is something that is uh, exceptionally important. All right, so I hope I've convinced you just with this alone that we need to be thinking more broadly and testing over and above just serology is, is, is absolutely necessary. Okay, so let's go specifically into uh, talking about congenital syphilis. This is really... This is really a um, uh, disease that is coming back into fashion. So not to make a kind of a joke about anything, but um, like everything, you know, fashion, what's popular in 1980s and 1990s is coming back in. Uh, what's old is new, and that includes um, infections, and syphilis is a great example of that. So the epidemiology is ever-changing. Um, so I've just put a couple of graphs here to try to convince you of that. So if we just look at North America, for example, I think actually North America is a great example and um, uh, of the evolving epi. Probably the, the, the states was the first one where syphilis really started to explode. Uh, and certainly we've seen that in, in Canada. And I would uh, really love to get your guys' um, out, uh, outlook on what's currently going on in Mexico as well. I would say that for Western Europe, the um, uh, the cases of syphilis are increasing, and as the cases of syphilis increase, obviously the cases of congenital syphilis increase as well. Although it's a bit slower than what we're seeing in uh, North America, uh, but uh, syphilis worldwide is one of the most common uh, congenital infections. So we see it everywhere. So if we look at the states, first of all, so as you can see here, it's really taken off in the past uh, 10 years. And this, um, uh, these are the number of cases. So there's thousands of cases now uh, a year of uh, diagnosed congenital syphilis. And this is not to mention the ones that are probably missed and will not be picked up until the children come to attention later on in life with potential problems. So I can this graph here ends at 2020, but I can assure you that the uh, bar graphs um, in the data from the last three years continues to increase exponentially. So that is quite worrisome. What is behind this is, is that really the, 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 the fundamental epidemiology of syphilis has changed. So 
where in the past it was primarily a disease of marginalized populations, particularly men who have sex with men, the um, uh, rates of syphilis have really spilled over into the general population, into the heterosexual population. And the, uh, the, the cases in women, specifically in women of childbearing age, are really the cases that are taking off at its highest rate. So if we look here, because I think this graph is a nice representation of that. So if we look at the cases, this is in Canada here on your left side. Uh, as you can see in the bar graph, the cases of congenital syphilis are increasing year to year. And again, similar to the, the United States, I can assure you that in the past two years, this is a, there's been a further exponential increase. So in our hotspots, particularly in the prairies in Canada, um, we're seeing uh, dozens and dozens of cases uh, a year. Uh, so up to about 100 cases of, of confirmed or probable syphilis. And that's not to mention all of the babies that have been exposed that uh, need diagnostics and follow up as well. So this very closely follows the uh, rates here in the line of diagnosed syphilis in females of reproductive age. So this is representative of females aged 15 to 39. So it's, it's, it's obvious that as more women, as more women of childbearing age are contracting syphilis, more babies will be diagnosed as well, if they are not treated, screened and treated appropriately in pregnancy. So in Mexico here on the far right, um, so probably at least from this publication, again, it's a bit on the older side, um, up to 2019, you can see very kind of similar trends at least, although the absolute numbers seem a bit uh, less. Um, so here as in the, the line, so these are the line that in this graph is, is numbers of congenital syphilis. And then in the darker bar graph, that is the number of uh, women who are diagnosed with syphilis who are going up uh, steadily, but not to the same, not at the same exponential rate that we are seeing in, uh, at least in Canada and the United States. Okay, so let's just kind of look back a bit of the basic biology of syphilis. So again, probably nothing new to the listeners on this call, but just as a review, so. Uh, syphilis is a spirochete. Uh, it's a treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum. Um, so it is very difficult to culture. So almost no labs are doing uh, culture anymore. You can see it on dark field microscopy, but again, that takes a lab that will do that. Um, syphilis, uh, so sexually transmitted syphilis, is indistinguishable, um, uh, at least in a lab, from non venereal treponema species. Uh, and this can also sometimes complicate um, diagnostics, uh, but the clinical presentation is, is, is quite different. So we have uh, Treponema pallidum pertenu, and this is yaws, which uh, used to be quite common. Um, we still do see it in predominantly lower middle income countries. It is a disease of skin, soft tissue, and in advanced stages can infect bone. We still do see it in places like the Pacific Islands and in Africa, and it is a disease that primarily affects children and can look sometimes in its kind of more milder forms, like almost like impetigo. Uh, more rarely, there's Treponema pallidum subspecies endemicum, and this is also known as Bejil, which is more common in the Middle East. This is a, a disease of the skin predominantly. Um, and lastly, Treponema pallidum uh, carateum, and this is Pinta, which is uh, more commonly seen in Latin America. And again, it is a skin disease. So if you have someone who has come from one of these areas and has positive syphilis serology, just keep in mind that the syphilis serology doesn't differentiate between non-sexually transmitted and sexually transmitted species. It is an obligate human pathogen, so this is not something that has come from animals um, uh, um, like many other pathogens. It is quite immune evasive, and as you can imagine, this is why there's a lot can be a long latency period without any symptoms. Um, it is really the great mimicker of many other pathogens uh, um, or diseases. So it can really present like a multitude of different things. So always keep it on your differential for anything, including in children. 
uh, the clinical manifestations actually result from the local inflammatory response. And that's actually something we measure when we measure the, the, the serology. Um, and this is elicited by the inflammation that's created by the spirochetes, uh, which replicate in the tissues themselves. Okay. So that's enough about the basics of, uh, of syphilis. So let's look a bit more specifically at congenital syphilis. So I just wanted to review the, because it's really important for um, uh, congenital syphilis uh, management and diagnostics, just a very brief review of the staging. So as you can see here um, on the right in this table, there are various stages, and this is important when you are assessing the mother uh, uh, who has been um, ideally treated in pregnancy because the stage will depend on what uh, adequacy of treatment she will get. So primary syphilis, uh, this is the classic kind of chancre. It's usually painless and it's at the inoculation site. It can be anywhere, but most commonly in the genitals. Uh, and this occurs about three to four weeks after exposure. You have secondary syphilis, which is a bit longer, up to about two months-ish. And this can present with rash, condylomalata, or other systemic symptoms. And then we have late, uh, or sorry, early latent syphilis. Uh, and that's when the acquisition of syphilis has been in the previous year, or late latent syphilis, which is when it has been acquired more than one year ago. When you do not know when it's been acquired, because the latent phases are, are asymptomatic by definition, um, the prudent thing to do would be to treat someone as a late latent infection. We then have tertiary syphilis, again, a very long latency period. And this is when you can get gummatous lesions, you can get cardiovascular involvement and CNS lesions, uh, sorry, CNS manifestations as well. So the, again, going back to this, the importance of, of determining the adequacy of treatment in the mum, this is also gonna be slightly different depending on where you work. So I always stress the importance of going back to your local guidelines. So in Canada anyways, in a pregnant woman, who has primary, secondary, or early latent infection in pregnancy, especially if it's in the latter half of pregnancy, we give them two doses of uh, benzathine penicillin, IM. Uh, whereas in a non-pregnant woman, they may only get one dose. Um, but again, go to your local guidelines because that's where, um, uh, that's where your, your guidelines will tell you whether or not to give one or two. When you don't know the, uh, as I mentioned, when you don't know when the uh, pregnant woman has acquired syph syphilis, you'll have to treat them as a late latent infection. Um, and that will require them to get three doses, three weekly doses of IM benzathine penicillin. Tertiary syphilis, depending on what it involves, is either uh, treated with, again, three doses uh, of benzathine penicillin some pathology is one dose, or often it's uh, treated with uh, IV uh, crystalline penicillin. So with that said, the overwhelming majority of cases are caused by in utero transmission, but you can get maternal to child transmission of syphilis that occurs actually at the time of delivery. In the past, it used to be thought that you could only get congenital syphilis if the acquisition was in the latter part of pregnancy, but actually there has been documented cases of uh, acquisition as early as nine to 10 weeks uh, of gestation. And the previous thought of why you couldn't, you couldn't transmit or you couldn't acquire congenital syphilis uh, was uh, that really they didn't, um, they didn't, they didn't see it probably because it was missed, but um, also the, uh, the immune system of the child really is, of the fetus, I should say, is, is not really mature until about 18 to 20 weeks. So even if you've acquired it before, you may actually not see manifestations of that in utero. So with uh, ultrasounds uh, or other kind of diagnostic radiological tests, until they've actually developed that immune response. Because if you remember going back to the basic biology, actually the inflammatory response to the syphilis spirochete is actually where you develop the pathology. The transmission is directly related to the stage uh, uh, of syphilis in the mother. So not only important to assess whether or not she was adequately treated, but it also gives you uh, an ability to kind of prognosticate a bit and what the risk of transmission to the baby is. So with regards to that, primary, secondary, uh, 
uh, infections, the risk to the child of, of transmission when the, the, the mother is untreated is at minimum about 70%. And some studies uh, uh, quote up to 90 to 100% uh, transmission to the fetus if the mom is untreated. In uh, early latent syphilis, in an untreated uh, maternal case, the risk of transmission to the baby is approximately 40%, so 30 to 40. And with late latent syphilis that's untreated, it's about 10%. If a mom is treated adequately before pregnancy, especially, the risk um, is slightly variable. If it's before pregnancy and we can document that she's had you know, negative titers or very low titers throughout pregnancy, the risk is close to zero, but they haven't, there have been documented cases even in adequately treated mums, even before pregnancy. Last but not least, if you are noticing that there is an increase in stillbirths in your area, because the one of the, the, the biggest manifestations of, of congenital syphilis is a stillbirth, one of the things that you may want to look in with your epidemiological colleagues or your public health colleagues is whether or not there has been an uptick of uh, syphilis or perhaps there's been an, an outbreak of syphilis uh, in your area because that can be the first tip off is an increase in stillbirth rates. So as I said before, syphilis is the great mimicker of all other uh, uh, diseases, both infectious and non-infectious. Um, so I already mentioned uh, the, the propensity to cause stillbirth. So approximately 40% of cases um, acquired in pregnancy uh, uh, may result in stillbirths. That can be uh, very late stillbirths, but um, the highest rate is in the early part of pregnancy. It's also probably why actually we miss a lot of congenital syphilis because they just manifest as stillbirths and we don't always know the cause of that. <clears throat> Although it's rare, necrotizing fundocytis, which I'll show you a picture of in the next uh, slides, is really pathognomonic of congenital syphilis. And what that looks like is a very bulky, swollen uh, umbilical cord. It almost looks like um, what you can imagine outside a barber shop, you know, where there's the, the white and red uh, barber pole. That's classically what it's described as. You can get uh, rhinitis or what is colloquially called snuffle. So it can be hemorrhagic in nature. This occurs in about 30 to 40 percent of cases. And you can actually find the syphilis treponemes in the uh, rhinitis um, uh, if you send it to the lab both under a micro dark field microscope or by PCR. I find that the rash can be exceptionally variable. So you can have vesicular lesions, you can have bullous lesions, you can have desquamating lesions, and this can often be mistaken for um, other infectious pathology, like I mentioned before, uh, cutaneous HSV, uh, but can also be mistaken for other non-infectious uh, pathology like epidermolysis bullosa, which I've, I've seen it being mistaken for before. It it has a propensity to affect the liver. So you can get hepatosplenomegaly, you can get a hepatitis, um, and this can occur really up in, in the first uh, two months. Um, you can also get uh, 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 jaundice with it as well. Where classically lymphadenopathy has been described, I will be honest, I don't see it very often. So it's it's reported to be in about 5% of the cases. It's It's classically described as a very diffuse lymphadenopathy. Um, neurosyphilis, so syphilis in, a, in an infant that has acquired it congenitally is almost, is more times than not asymptomatic. So uh, about 50% per, percent of cases will have no symptoms that may tip you off to uh, meningitis in a neonate. But as you guys know, meningitis in a neonate at baseline is sometimes difficult to diagnose. Uh, uh, anyways, which is why, at least in Canada, uh, and again, the importance of going back to your local guidelines, we have stayed with the re recommendations to do an LP as part of the diagnostic workup. Uh, um, uh, whereas the Americans have said it's probably less important, and that's because you're going to be treating the baby with 10 days of penicillin anyways. The importance, I think, of, 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 of assessing for neurosyphilis is that it really um, affects what the uh, follow-up is, in, in my opinion, um, and that's because the data shows that there are different neurodevelopmental outcomes in a baby that has congenital syphilis with neurological involvement versus a baby who does not. <clears throat> 
you can often see musculoskeletal findings. So at birth, the classic is the finding is perichondritis. So it looks very similar to like osteomyelitis with elevation of the periosteum. You can find this on long bone x-rays. Uh, and this occurs in about 25% of cases. The classic radiological features is, is Wimberger sign, which is periostitis of the medial tibial bone. And then you can get musculoskeletal findings later on in life, like pseudoparalysis. You can get um, uh, changes in your maxillary bones. Uh, you can get a saddle nose or wing scapula, but that happens much later. Um, hematologic findings. So you can really get a plethora of different findings, anemia, thrombocytopenia, again, why it can very closely mimic sepsis uh, and, uh, and needs to be on your consideration when you have a very abnormal CBC. The classic Hutchinson's triad, so that's your interstitial keratitis, your Hutchinson's teeth, which I'll show you a picture of in a second, and your mulberry molars, which again, I'll show you a picture of in a second, is really the findings that you have in an older child when they have uh, congenital syphilis that was missed in the neonatal period. You similarly can get um, eighth nerve deafness, so sensor neuro hearing loss, but that is also a, ladder, uh, a later manifestation um, which you will generally find in a, an older child who was not treated in infancy. So these are just some pictures. So as I mentioned, stillbirths, fetal demise, you can get high drops or premature births, and that's your kind of fetal findings. This is the kind of classic picture that you see with uh, uh, um, uh, rhinitis or hemorrhagic rhinitis. Uh, so baby is very, very snotty. Uh, you can find the syphilis in the, in the, the samples if you swab it. Here are just one example of these of lesions that you can see. It can affect the palms and the soles. It can really affect any part of the body. It can desquamate, um, and um, uh, um, you can find it if you if you swab um, these lesions. You can also find it molecularly the syphilis as well. Here is the necrotizing fenocytis. So this is as you can see here. It's quite like a, a bulky cord. Um, you can see these kind of. Uh, uh, alternating white and not so white um, bands on the cord. Again, not a common finding, but is pathognomonic. So here is that classic Wimberger sign. So you can see elevation in the, the medial uh, tibia here. It can, it's often bilateral, but can be of the wrists, uh, wrists or the, the, the arm bones as well. Um, uh, and hence the importance of doing uh, long bone x-rays. The latter findings, so here you can see there's keratitis, so that's definitely not a, a normal um, uh, uh, cornea or pupil there. And then you have the uh, Hutchinson's teeth, so these kind of peg-like teeth, they often have a central notch. Uh, and then your mulberry molars here, which kind of look like berries because they have a kind of central almost punctum with a ring around them. And, and these are just some of the findings, but uh, when things just don't add up, Think of syphilis. All right. So we've thought of syphilis. Where are we going to go from there? So as I mentioned before, the first thing to do is determine whether or not the mum has been adequately treated in pregnancy. Then we're all pediatricians, right? We need to go to the baby. We need to examine the baby. Do they have any of those findings that I talked about previously? If the baby has any findings compatible with syphilis, they absolutely require investigations irrespective of the maternal serology. And this is a very important point because many of the babies that I see in my setting that have true proven or probable syphilis is in mums that have actually um, tested negative in pregnancy. So it's women who have had uh, a late um, either third trimester uh, acquisition of syphilis um, or who haven't been tested at all, or who have been tested and treated, but then have been reinfected. So that's another thing to consider as well. It's also important to go again back to your local guidelines to see how many times in pregnancy women are tested, uh, because if they're tested early or in their second trimester or in their first trimester, and that is the only test, that leaves many, many months for acquisition to, uh, of syphilis to have been acquired. So in many settings, at least where I work, where syphilis rates are very high, um, we test up to four times in pregnancy. So in each trimester and then in every woman at delivery, and that's irrespective of what your risk factors are. 
Based on these, you can determine who, which babies should undergo a complete workup for congenital syphilis. So this is, I think, a nice kind of flow diagram. I've taken this from our Canadian Pediatric Society guideline. Um, so it just gives you four questions that you can ask in any situation. So was the mother treated with penicillin? So just remember that penicillin is the only um, uh, antibiotic that we would consider uh, uh, adequate treatment. That dogma is probably going to change, but hasn't changed yet. Um, but uh, no other antibiotic at the moment is considered adequate treatment. And for, for example, in a mom who is uh, uh, allergic to penicillin, what we would do is we desensitize um, her. We need to ask ourselves, was the maternal treatment completed more than four weeks before delivery? If it was not, then the risk is high. Was treatment adequate for the stage of infection? Again, go back to your staging and how many doses is uh, adequate. And was there adequate treatment response documented? So what you really want to look for is at least a fourfold decline in the non-treponemal test. So that's your RPR or VDRL. Uh, uh, however, this also depends on when the woman has been infected because it does take time for your uh, non-treponemal titers to decline. Remember as well that your non-treponemal titers will uh, decline even without treatment. So even if it's declined, that does not mean that you're in the clear um, if the mum has not been treated adequately. So if the answer is no to any of these questions, or you're worried about reinfection, or there is problems uh, or concerns antenatally with ultrasounds that are suggestive of congenital syphilis, or obviously on your exam if you are worried, all of these babies would be deemed high risk and should have a full workup. So what is a full workup? So the first thing, the easiest thing is a, a, to do a paired maternal uh, fetal serology at birth. Uh, and I do stress that it is important to do it from a venipuncture, not from the umbilical cord. And that's because you can get um, contamination of the, uh, from mom's blood. So it is important that we make sure that we're testing mom's blood and baby's blood so we can get a good comparison. I always find that syphilis serology can often be a bit confusing. So just to review very briefly, so your non-treponemal tests, that's your VDRL and your RPR. This is what changes with treatment or with time. Um, but there are a subset of, uh, of people who will stay in what we call a serofast state. And that's when you've been treated adequately, but your RPR never goes fully undetectable. But it really shouldn't be over one, sometimes two dilutions at most, one to four. Then you have your treponemal test. So these are much more specific, uh, but these, once you've been uh, infected with syphilis, even if you've been treated, these will stay positive for life. So what many labs do is what we call a reverse algorithm. So they'll do a screening treponemal test followed by a non-treponemal test and a confirmatory treponemal test. Again, it's important that you go to your lab to see what they're doing because um, there are still certain labs that do the, the conventional algorithm. When we're looking at the CSF specifically, so the CSF, the, um, in at least in Canada, we do a VDRL. Again, going back to your lab, um, in the UK, they do an RPR. It lacks sensitivity, but if it is reactive, it's diagnostic of neurosyphilis. You can do FTA antibodies I, in the CSF. I will be honest, I never do it. It's more helpful if they are negative. It's less helpful if they are positive, and that's simply because the specificity is low. You can do PCR and think about all of those samples that I, I've talked about before that you can do PCR from. So the nasal secretions, the skin, um, uh, you can do it from the CSF, but it often requires a, a specific lab uh, to do that. So uh, in Canada, there's only one lab that we would send all our PCRs to, um, in the CSF to, uh, and the turnaround time is, is quite long. So it doesn't really make much clinical difference. Long bone x-rays to see those uh, uh, findings of uh, perichondritis, uh, or sorry, periostitis. You get your ophthalmology colleagues to look particularly for posterior eye disease, so chorioretinitis. You get your audiology colleagues to do diagnostic ABRs. And that's really important more so in babies who have had confirmed congenital syphilis. Um, and then just basic blood work. You wanna check your, your liver enzymes, your platelets, uh, et cetera. Okay, so what do we do for management? So my 
opinion is that if the 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 question of congenital syphilis comes up and you're unsure or you think that they have congenital syphilis or even if you think that they may have congenital syphilis but the risk of loss to follow up is very high my bottom line is that there's less harm in treating them than missing it so our threshold at least in canada in treating uh babies with um, uh, uh, congenital syphilis is very, very low. The treatment uh, recommendation is still 10 days of intravenous aqueous uh, crystalline penicillin G. So just to remember that the dose changes. Um, so after seven days of life, um, sorry, I the dose is the same, but the frequency changes. So it goes from two times a day to three times a day. As you can imagine, many of these babies will have been treated for rule out sepsis, uh, especially if they, you know, they present very sick. And many of these regimens will contain ampicillin, so usually, or another beta lactam like cefotaxime, um, uh, and typically gram negative coverage, so like tobramycin or gentamicin. But as of now, any other beta lactams, particularly if you're using it for sepsis syndromes, it does not replace the need for IV penicillin. So we do not count that in the treatment. Um, the, it is really important to have um, adequate IV access because it can be tricky, especially in a baby, to have um, uh, 10 whole days of, of I, IV treatment. So some centers will use a long IV line. Um, some will even insert a PICC line. It's actually very helpful if you can do an umbilical catheter uh, because that can typically stay in for about a week. Um, and, and that's important because you really don't want to miss too many doses. Um, and there are some guidelines that do recommend if you've missed more than 24 hours of penicillin, that actually you need to restart the whole treatment. There are other options, albeit I can, um, uh, it is difficult, at least in my setting to, to find, uh, other options beyond intravenous, uh, penicillin. So there is, I am procaine penicillin in Canada. We can't really get it. Uh, and the important thing about that is even if you're going to use it, it does not um, uh, adequately cross the blood-brain barrier. So again, going back to the importance of ensuring that you know if there is CNS involvement or not, if you're going to use procaine penicillin. Uh, it is very, very reasonable, especially if the baby is unwell or is at high risk of congenital syphilis, or certainly if they have clinical findings compatible with congenital syphilis, it is very reasonable to initiate empiric therapy uh, whilst you're waiting for all your investigations. And that's because, I mean, depending on your lab capabilities, it may take quite a long time uh, uh, to get your results back. And really, these babies should be treated empirically, uh, um, especially if there's high risk. Um, there are other kind of recommendations. So some experts will use IM benzathine penicillin uh, in certain circumstances. In general, I tend to, to um, not advocate for this. It again does not cross the blood brain barrier adequately. So that's one uh, drawback. Uh, but uh, in, in, in certain circumstances where it may be difficult to follow up the baby or where IV access may be difficult, it could be an option. But the best option is 10 days of IV penicillin. Okay, management. So again, I took this from our Canadian uh, guideline and I just think it gives a good breakdown of kind of how to risk stratify uh, babies and what to do in each circumstance. So again, going back to the basics. So it's important to first review maternal details, their previous serology, did they go down in pregnancy with their um, non-treponemal test? So usually that will be an RPR. Uh, did they get treatment and was that treatment adequate? And are there any infect reinfection risks? Now, the first thing to do, uh, which would be the probably one of the more helpful things, is as quick as possible. So trying to expedite the paired maternal infant serology at delivery. So here is kind of just the four general scenarios that we broke it down into. Um, and this is just I find this a good way to help me kind of compartmentalize things. So if you have a woman that was treated for syphilis pre-pregnancy, her non-treponemal titers decreased fourfold, it was adequate treatment. During pregnancy, her RPR stayed very low, ideally negative. Uh, and uh, you've confirmed that there are no uh, reinfection risks and the baby's exam is normal, then congenital syphilis is unlikely. Your risk is very, very, very low. If you have a mum 
that has had a uh, fourfold decrease in her titers during pregnancy, after treatment in pregnancy, and she's had adequate treatment with the right amount of doses and with penicillin, and she's been treated more than four weeks before delivery, and again, there's no risk for reinfection, and the baby's exam is normal. The risk to the baby is pretty low, uh, so we would call this congenital syphilis is possible, but is less likely. So again, you're essentially going to be doing uh, paired serology on every baby, irrespective of the risk, but the, the, the paired serology may then help you further risk stratify after you get the results back. If we go to the kind of higher risk situation, so these are, for example, uh, uh, mums who have uh, not had a fourfold decrease in their RPR titers, or whose treatment wasn't adequate, i.e. they had the wrong uh, type of antibiotic, the wrong amount of doses, or the wrong timing, or you are concerned about reinfection, then we would call this congenital syphilis is possible, and they should have a full workup with everything that we've talked about in the last slide. If you have a mum who has not been treated, her non treponemal titers have not decreased or they've gone up, if you have an abnormal exam in the baby, or you found syphilis, either um, microscopically, if you have a lab that can do culture, again, it's not readily available, or you isolate it by PCR, then we would call this congenital syphilis is proven or probable. And, and again, these babies that are higher risk should be treated empirically whilst you're doing the workup. The CDC has quite similar um, definitions and uh, they have a nice breakdown as well. So that's another good resource that you can go to if you are a bit unsure about what to do in particular circumstances. As I mentioned before, if you are ever unsure or if you think the baby will not be followed up, my recommendation, and I do this quite often, is I just treat the baby and then you don't have to worry. So just because we're getting a bit low on time, I will probably uh, stop almost after this one. So after this slide. So follow-up is uh, essential for all babies. Uh, and what you do want to do, again, this is, I, I've taken from our Canadian guideline. What you essentially want to do is follow up the serology that's uh, twofold. A, to make sure that the RPR decreases um, uh, in the baby. And what you really want to prove is that your treponema-specific uh, uh, serology, so that's typically the TPPA, disappears in the baby. And that should never last beyond about 18 months. And if it is still there at 18 months, that is one of your diagnostic criteria for uh, proving congenital syphilis. I'm going to, just for two minutes, because I want to give at least 10 minutes for time, touch on congenital enterovirus. So my main message is that we have very limited data. So we don't really know much about the epidemiology. We know a bit more about enterovirus, but not specifically congenital enterov enterovirus. It's spread fecal orally, but can also be spread uh, by respiratory secretions. Um, there's very high secondary spread in households. So again, important when you're asking the history, is there a, a toddler in the house? Is there a child who goes to daycare or go to school who may have then infected the mother? And the mother even may be asymptomatic at the time. Because about 60% of mothers uh, of infected infants uh, report a febrile illness. So it's, it's actually about 40% of the mums will actually be totally fine. As you know, it's a, a small non-envelope viruses. There's many serotypes and par echovirus, although it is categorized differently because of its genomic properties, it has a very simil similar clinical picture. So we're talking in the realm of case reports here, case reports and case series, but um, uh, clinical features, they can be observed in utero, they uh, even, or, or occurring really quickly after delivery. So it can present like sepsis, and some can even have viremia detected within hours after. Importantly, about a third have a biphasic illness about a week after, um, uh, so they can even look like they've recovered and then have secondary manifestations after that, particularly myocarditis. So some centers would advocate for repeating an echo uh, uh, and specifically repeating an echo if you have any cardiac concerns. It can present like sepsis with meningoencephalitis with quite severe CNS involvement. I've seen two with an HLH or hyperinflammatory like picture. It has a predilection for the heart and the liver, so you can get myocarditis and hepatitis, uh, but actual fetal anomalies uh, are very rarely reported. So 
Sampling is important, so you can find it by PCR in the CSF, the blood, the NPA, so this is the nasal pharyngeal aspirate, or the stool, and the stool, it secretes the longest. Sometimes it's helpful to, uh, again, it's more academic, but you can isolate it in the enterovirus by PCR in the mum. So I often ask for a stool sample in mum, because if you pick the, up the enterovirus in mum, you can also serotype it to see if it's the same as the baby. That can be helpful, although not so much clinically, more so academically. You want to do routine investigations. Certainly, if the baby has CNS involvement, you want to do an LP. And I think brain imaging is quite important because they often have inflammatory uh, uh, um, changes on their MRI. There's no specific treatment. We have uh, antivirals, but they're not readily available. Uh, the one thing that you may consider is IVIG. And the important piece about this is that the earlier you give it, the better. But really, the, the data uh, is, is, is not clear for IVIG, but it's probably the thing that is given most frequently. Uh, supportive care is actually what is the most important for these babies. Follow-up is important. Um, the, the factors uh, that influence your, your outcomes are things like gestational age at delivery, if the mother was symptomatic, and that can correlate with her level of viremia around the time of delivery. If the infection was very early in life, there are some reports that certain uh, uh, strains of uh, enterovirus uh, cause more severe pathology. And then the route of transmission can also affect um, the pathology in the baby. So I'm going to end there. Sorry, I was a bit over time, but I think we still have maybe five to 10 minutes of questions. Uh, sorry to have gone through the last little bit a bit rushed, but I think syphilis is, if you're going to take home anything, syphilis is the most important. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much, Justin, for this quite in-depth uh, update on congenital syphilis and for delivering the message of rethinking the classic torch classification and for delivering this message of uh, rethinking this, this uh, whole congenital infection scenario. So uh, as, as you were presenting your brilliant presentation, we were receiving a few questions, but when you started talking about enterovirus, uh, the, the question started uh, uh, appearing more frequently. So the audience might be a little sure. interested on enterovirus. So yep. maybe we can ask a few questions regarding that. And one particular question was really interesting regarding uh, in the setting of a patient that is uh, admitted in the NICU in the first days of life, and the patient is septic, but you haven't uh, actually recovered a bacterial etiology on, on blood cultures or even fertile cultures, when would you consider the, the, the perfect timing or the, or the adequate timing of performing a lumbar puncture in search of enterovirus or paracovirus? When, when would you consider like this particularly a specific time when you have to perform a lumbar puncture? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the guidelines will will differ a bit everywhere. So it depends. There's certainly a case by case scenario. So if you have a baby that is seizing, a baby that has neurological findings, I think that you absolutely need to do a lumbar puncture, uh, and you're going to send it for HSV and enterovirus. If you have done uh, viral testing, like a nasal pharyngeal swab, for some reason, and it's positive for enterovirus, my practice is I would do a lumbar puncture. There's more than just enterovirus that can cause culture negative sepsis. So CMV can also cause it. Um, syphilis, as I mentioned, can also cause it. Many of the other congenital infections. So although you need to think enterovirus, there's also plenty of other things where CSF may be an important specimen to get. So I guess that the, we generally start to think about it if we've not um, uh, had a pathogen after 36 to 48 hours and there's deterioration in the infant. Thank you so much. And exactly that is the, the, the like the, the hardest question of all because you have to speak to the families and also you, you don't want to perform anything that is invasive for the patient, but that would be a great uh, uh, approach. Thank you, Justin. And also a few questions regarding CMV because uh, you obviously uh, went through syphilis with, with great uh, brilliance. So regarding CMV, two quick questions. And one is a, a, a very common and one, one of the doc doctors in the audience is asking, which would you consider uh, the preferred diagnostic method for CMV, considering that sometimes we perform saliva PCRs or blood PCRs, but there is this 
thing when uh, the baby has already been fed with with uh, with uh, um, the mother's breast milk. Um, breast milk. So, when would you con which diagnostic method would you consider to be the, the best? So, so urine is still the gold standard. Um, saliva is obviously easier to get than uh, urine, but as you mentioned, it can be contaminated with saliva. So, in the centers that do do it um, more frequently, so. I can talk about my center specifically, but um, you just need to make sure that it's done at least one hour after the baby has fed and that there's not obvious milk in the mouth. Um, but but urine is the preferred. Uh, blood is not great because although it's helpful if it's positive, uh, it, uh, it is often negative because by the time the baby is born, depending on when they have acquired CMV in utero, uh, you may not be viremic. Um, so... In, and in my setting, we do universal CMV screening on the newborn blood spot, but that has a sensitivity only of about 85%. So you still will miss babies. So my main message is to people is if if the baby's newborn blood spot is negative, or it often takes two weeks to, to come back, uh, if you have signs or symptoms that are suggestive that it could be CMV, then they should send a urine. And we actually send a urine and a saliva um, at the same time um, because we have a pilot uh, project. And I know that many NICUs as an entrance screening will do a saliva PCR, uh, and that's included in the recommendations from the European um, consensus for CMV, uh, but that obviously comes with cost. And the main okay. the main help for that is because you can the main reason to do that is it's much easier to then distinguish whether uh, premature babies have postnatally acquired CMV or prenatally acquired like congenital CMV because the treatment and the follow up is completely different. Exactly, that's a tricky tricky scenario. So we we are running a little short of time. So one quick final question, and that, this is also regarding CMV. Uh, and this one comment that you made on MRIs. So MRIs are currently displacing uh, uh, transfrontal ultrasounds uh, to, to looking for imaging uh, findings of congenital CMB. But it, it's usually uh, we usually have a hard time convincing clinicians and families regarding the risks of uh, sedation and the benefits that we would achieve with this. So how would you approach? maybe a clinician and also a family uh, when asking for an MRI and in suspicion of congenital CMV? Yeah, that's a good question. I just want to clarify that MRIs will not replace ultrasounds. So ultrasounds are A, a good screening modality um, because it will pick up certain things, um, but MRIs will miss certain things if you're not looking for it or you're not doing the right um, sequencing. So for example, um, periventricular calcifications are much better picked up on an ultrasound than an MRI. So my practice is that we always do an ultrasound as a screen. And then if any there are any positive findings, we will always do an MRI. There are certain centers that will do an ultrasound and an MRI on everyone. My personal practice is that we do not sedate any babies. So we will do a feed and wrap for all babies. So it avoids the necessity for any anesthesia or any sedation. So it's really a relatively, there's just really no risk associated with it. It's really the amount of time, the resources and the cost. Um, again, it depends on what kind of setting you're working in, whether it's you know a private or public setting. Um, uh, but we would offer an MRI, at least in, in our setting, to anyone with any abnormalities on their ultrasound. And as I mentioned, many centers will do it on everyone. Thank you so much, Justin. And thank you. We are running short of time. So I'm going to thank you again for being here with us in our session. And I'm going to switch to Spanish to, to thank the audience. Muchas gracias a todos por estar presentes en nuestra sesión de la Escuela de Medicina y Ciencias de la Salud del Departamento de Pediatría. Y gracias otra vez al Dr. Justin Penner por haber estado con nosotros. Nos encantaría recordarles que en nuestra próxima sesión vamos a tener también ponentes internacionales, en este caso el doctor Paul Offit, que nos va a platicar un poco sobre el movimiento antivacunas y cómo podemos taclear esta duda y estas eh, situaciones que llevan a que una familia no desee vacunar a sus hijos o hijas y pues que las coberturas estén disminuyendo a como actualmente se vive. Muchas gracias a todos y nos vemos la próxima semana.